a short time ago. NATO Chief Jens Stoltenberg spoke to reporters and said that at next week's summit, NATO's leaders would reaffirm Ukraine's desire to join the alliance and discuss how to bring Kyiv closer to that goal. First, we will agree a multi-year program of assistance to ensure full interoperability between the Ukrainian armed forces and NATO. Second, we will upgrade our political ties by establishing the NATO-Ukraine Council. And third, I expect Allied leaders will reaffirm that Ukraine will become a member of NATO and unite on how to bring Ukraine closer to its goal. And for more on this story, we're joined by our international affairs commentator, Douglas Herbert. We're also joined by Yavis Beydar, a journalist and editor of the independent news site, freeturkishpress.com. Thank you both for being here. Doug, I want to start with you. First of all, what do you make of these comments from Stoltenberg on the possibility of Ukraine joining NATO? Trying to get anything out of those comments, it's, it's, you might say it's like squeezing blood from a stone. There's, there's nothing there, really. Um, it's steady as she goes. What We've been saying this forever. What Zelensky is looking for when he says a clear signal of NATO support uh, for its membership bid, it is that as soon as the war ends, not years after, not months after, as soon as the war ends, NATO will reaffirm, reaffirm that it will take Ukraine into the fold. That is not what we heard in that wording here. It's vague. It's deliberately vague. It's ambiguous because the NATO allies have splits among themselves, the pace at which they should be ready to admit Ukraine. So in the absence of a consensus among the 30 NATO members, with the blocs being mostly the Eastern and Central European uh, NATO members, much more in favor of right now, tomorrow, get Ukraine in as soon as possible, uh, you know, and the U.S., some southern countries, Germany taking a much more cautious approach uh, later as opposed to sooner. Uh, in the absence of that consensus, all they could continue to say, all the, the Secretary General can say of NATO is trot out those security guarantees. The language becomes so vague as to be empty. I'll tell you one thing. It's not what Zelensky wants to hear, but by now Zelensky is resigned to the fact that that's what he's going to hear. Looking forward to this meeting with Erdogan. You know, the, Turkey is really an ally of Ukraine, but does business with Russia. So Erdogan really is doing a balancing act, isn't he? Some people call the tightrope act. Look, it's easy to bash Turkey as trying to have it both ways, you know, trying to balance a cordial relationship with Moscow, a transactional, mostly business-heavy economic relationship with Russia, with its status as a NATO member, um, with EU aspirations as well, and an ally, putative ally of the West. But geopolitical necessity, if you just to look at the facts, probably requires Turkey to play this sort of delicate balancing act, as you put it. On the one hand, I, and I'm going to say on the one hand, on the other hand, on the one hand, Turkey actually has has been pretty staunchly in support of Ukraine. It hasn't joined EU and U.S. sanctions against Ukraine. That's true. But what has it done? Early in the war, it supplied those Bayraktar drones, which were very crucial and pivotal, some would say, in the early military successes of Ukraine, also supplied armored vehicles, also interdicted, that is, forbid warships to enter the Turkish Straits, which was a pretty firm position as well. And it has been going way back, even to the annexation of Crimea, a pretty firm defender of the rights of the minority of the t Crimean Tatars uh, in, in Crimea. You might say, well, that's a, a minor, petty little issue. It really isn't. Because well before the rest of the world was really coming to the defense of anyone in Crimea, Turkey was actually denouncing the annexation of Crimea and defending this minority, which human rights groups have say have really come up against it and been almost abused uh, by the Russian occupants there in Crimea. So contrary to the popular perception, Turkey has been an ally of Ukraine, and that has hardened, as Russia has shown in the in the view of many military analysts, more brutality on the battlefield, atrocities have come to light, and all of that. At the same time, yes, it's had an economic dependence on Russia. Russia. Uh, with the gas, selling the gas to Turkey, using it as a gateway when it's isolated from the rest of the world. Um, and it has also, Russia just helped it build a new nuclear plant uh, in Akuyu. So there's de definitely that business tie. Lots of Russians in Turkey right now. They don't need visas to go there. I was just in Istanbul. You see them everywhere. So Turkey really, like I said, geopolitical position and necessity dictating the fact that it is involved in that very delicate balancing act. But it doesn't mean it's not an ally of Ukraine. It's very much shown its support for Kiev. Yavuz Bedar, I want to bring you into the conversation. The Kremlin said it will be following this meeting between Erdogan and Zelensky uh, very closely. What kind of pressure is Erdogan under when it comes to Russia and his relationship with Vladimir Putin? 
Well, not much at all, not much pressure at all. It's a very critical uh, meeting, critical time-wise, because it's just before the Vilnius uh, the NATO summit, and uh, Erdogan is, there are rumors that Erdogan uh, will meet Joe Biden, apart from the, uh, the meeting with the Swedish Foreign Prime Minister, Ulf Kristersson, on Monday. So uh, it's, uh, as Douglas said, it's a balancing act. It's a tightrope walk. It's brinkmanship, whichever word you use it, for, for Erdogan again. And he loves those situations. And he has a powerful team with Ibrahim Kalun, the Secret Service chief now, and uh, uh, Hakan Fidan, who was the former Secret Service chief, uh, is, who is the prime uh, the, the, the foreign minister, and those that that trio uh, is going to have a lot to do, especially uh, you know given that the meeting with uh, Zelensky. Uh, between Erdogan and Zelensky today in, in Ankara is, uh, first of all, a charm offensive uh, for, for Erdogan, uh, for, for West, for EU, for, for, the, for NATO, and for, for the United States. And uh, although the top item agenda will definitely be the grain deal and the grain corridor, because the time deadline is the uh, 17th of, of July, in a, in a week's time, and that's critical. And um, Zelensky will not do it naturally the, the ask uh, Erdogan to, to talk to Putin, uh, and Erdogan will not say no, because this is, you know, co co uh, the, the, the sort of convergence of, of interests of, uh, between these two leaders. And in Zelensky, as uh, again Douglas said, is, is, is fully aware of the fence-sitting position that Erdogan has uh, for a long time, and he doesn't want to shake the fence, because uh, that's very delicate. And uh, Erdogan will not say no, uh, and uh, there will be dialogue, continued dialogue with Putin. And also, Erdogan Erdogan will continue to, to Vilnius uh, with that positive bag. Uh, uh, tonight we will hear a lot of positive uh, wording uh, uh, to, to these two leaders. And uh, also uh, Zelensky certainly will reiterate his uh, will, uh, intention, aspiration for, for NATO membership for Ukraine. And Erdogan might not say no to that, of course not. Uh, for him, the, 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 the thing that matters for Erdogan is far beyond that. It is uh, his uh, troubled relationship with the U.S. Uh, and again, this meeting today will be another, yet another instrument for, for Erdogan to uh, force the legitimacy, uh, although he's seen as the spiteful, uh, problematic uh, black sheep member of NATO. Uh, he sees all those possibilities as, as, as window of opportunities to, to, to solidify, to cement his, his legitimacy. So uh, a lot is at stake, but I think the, 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 given the bird's eye view, uh, Erdogan has uh, all the advantages now uh, for before the Vilnius summit. You mentioned the grain deal that Turkey helped secure last year. It's once again in jeopardy, as you pointed out, set to expire on July 17th. And again, we're talking about getting around a Russian blockade of uh, Ukrainian grain in the Black Sea. Doug, do you think that Turkey can help negotiate an extension to the deal? Uh, I think uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, uh, this was a hard-won deal for him, and he's been able to sort of deflect in the glory of that deal on the world stage. He's one of the few people, one of the few leaders, if anyone can, who's been able to actually go directly to both Ukraine and to and to Russia and, and speak with each side. So when you talk about the grain deal, we're talking about a deal that was at least on paper brokered by Turkey and the United Nations and Ukraine and Russia. That's quite a group there. I think uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan wants to show, and this goes back to uh, to the comments we just heard, um, also wants to uh, show the U United States that it can play a role that's also positive and, and, and that it's not just reflexively always hostile to the U.S. and European powers. And I think that by clinching an extension to this grain deal and putting bringing that pressure to bear on Putin to do so, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan would definitely see it as, as a clear victory and, and a sense of uh, validating his sense of, uh, of a, an Erdogan who's right now sort of striding atop, you know, in, in sort of a, a regional spring in his step, if you will, you know, really on the world stage now, being able to exert his influence and flex his muscles more than ever. So yeah, I think he's going to bring pressure to bear on Putin to extend the deal yet again. Let's not forget that Russia has been accused of using food as a weapon. That's obviously not an accusation that Russia likes. It hits back uh, against it. But let's not also forget that without this deal, uh, you do have uh, basically the risk of famine for millions of people, because that grain won't get to the markets that it's needed to get to, um, and also the risk of prices spiking, shooting up, making the food uh, essentially 
easily uh, and accessible economic from an economic standpoint. So I do think that the uh, that we're going to see an extension. I think that Russia keeps you know this is repeatedly keeps upping the ante and bringing this its brinkmanship down to the wire with this food deal. But in the end, we we do see that extension. We have so much more to discuss, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. International affairs commentator Doug Herbert and Yavis Bedar, journalist and editor at the independent news site FreeTurkishPress.com. Thank you so much both uh, for joining us here on France 24.